Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast, home of the mysterious and the macabre, where we sit in the studio every week challenging conventional thought. We are your hosts, Samantha Carter and Sarah Jones. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on whichever app you listen to your podcasts on. With that, let's get to today's topic. The sources for all of our information, as well as links to each publication, are available in our show notes. We do our best to obtain detailed and accurate information on all subjects that we cover and fit as much of the pertinent information as possible into our time slot so you get a well-rounded story all in one place. But we do encourage you, if you're interested, to dig a little deeper for yourself. We do really encourage that. One thing that we've found when doing these episodes is that you dig for information and it's so quick to fall into a rabbit hole with it because one little piece of information leads to a whole other story and then that leads to this other story. So really, if you're interested in this stuff, just start reading about it. You'll get lost in it every single time. There's more to know. There's always more to know. This week, we've got a horrifying tale, which happens to have roots in our home state. For those of you who have never heard this story, you're in for a cringe-inspiring ride. The man of the hour is Norman G. Baker, Baker was born in the year 1882 in a town called Muscatine, Iowa, to a well-to-do family. He was the last of either eight or ten. Different sources said different numbers. Children born to John and his wife, Frances. According to Wikipedia, his father, John, owned the Baker Manufacturing Company, the first sheet iron and boiler factory in Muscatine, which developed canning machinery. John had about 126 patented inventions credited to him. Norman's mother had been a writer of poetry and short stories before she got married. And then once you get married, obviously as a woman in that time period, you can't have a career. Couldn't even vote. Women hadn't suffraged yet. Not quite yet. It's coming. So at the age of 16, Norman left school and took a job as a machinist, working as a toolmaker, traveling from town to town in search of jobs. He can best be described as an entrepreneur and a resourceful man from what I have found. Pretty much anything he set his mind to doing, he found a way to get it done. In some cases, most cases in fact, this was actually quite unfortunate. Indeed. It sounds as though he was a rather flamboyant character, which may have aided him in his success, if success is what you'd call it. This was a man, it seems, with one direction in mind, forward, at the expense of anyone. Always one of those. Trample the weak hurdle the dead literally make the weak dead <laughs> yep none of my business though as you sip your coffee in your fancy cup norman was working in the circus as a barker what's a barker um the ones that go out and yell stuff oh. you know bark the things oh come to the circus hey okay you there is a fly in here and it's driving me nuts okay so he was out promoting a two-headed calf as well as other carnival oddities and recently he had contracted and recovered from a serious illness and felt mental abilities helped him in that healing. In fact, it would be a mental suggestion performance by a man titled Professor Flint, which would inspire his next step forward. Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. It's an ominous step in the wrong direction, all the wrong directions. He witnessed the performance and then set out to produce his own version in 1904, dubbing himself Charles Welch. So he changed his name? He changed it his name. Okay, so now he's Charles Welch. It was a bit of a slow start, but eventually his efforts paid off, and Baker became a hit on the vaudeville circuit, especially in Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. Baker's show featured a mind reader known as Madame Pearl Tangley, according to Alvin Winston in, quote, The Throttle. Norman needed his lady mind reader to have a name that was more unique than Baker. He had thumbed through the alphabet trying to come up with something when the letter T caught his eye. Ah, that had an impressive curve followed by a long sweeping line over the, over the stop of the stem for the top. It would look wonderful in script on a billboard. He then added more letters until he again was impressed with, quote, tan, and then tang. The astronauts are impressed with tang, too. Yeah, actually, I think I, I wasn't. No, I don't think we liked it. I think it was gross. I think we were super excited and we made our mom buy it because we saw it on a commercial with a monkey. You know, the <gasps> orangutan, the tang orangutan. No, I don't remember that. And then we got it and we're like, oh. It's gross. It is gross. I, I like Sunny D. It was okay, but it tasted fake. It's like orange syrup. So now he's at tang. 
Finally, he arrived at the word tangly, a word he had never heard of before and one that wasn't even recognizable by the local post office authorities. This would be the name befitting to his star performer. The original star of the show quit, but she was quickly replaced by a college student, Teresa Pinder, who just a year later became Norman's wife. My foot's asleep, kind of tangly. Nah. It was also speculated and stated by Barbara Kerr, whose father was a distant cousin to Norman Baker, who wrote in an email to a fellow named Marty, whose last name I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Quote, early in the century, there was a popular vaudeville figure named Eva Tangway. Norman went into vaudeville and named one of his leading ladies Tangley to echo Tangui's name. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, Eva Tangway was an American singing and dancing comedian billed as, quote, the girl who made vaudeville famous. Apparently, she shocked audiences with her scanty costumes and risque songs. Va, va, boom. When Norman and Teresa moved back to Muscatine, along with her father, who happened to be a preacher as well as an organist and piano and organ repairman, it happened that Norman's wife also played the piano. With their knowledge and talents at his disposal, as well as a need for more advertising in his continuing vaudeville shows, came the idea for an invention of their first air calliope in 1914. Initially, this invention was aptly called the Tangly Air Calliope and later renamed the Calliophone, which used compressed air instead of steam. What is a Calliophone or a Calliope, you ask? Well, according to the infinite wisdom of Encyclopedia Britannica, it is a steam whistle organ with a loud, shrill sound audible miles away. Originally invented in the United States about 1850 by A.S. Denny and patented in 1855 by Joshua C. Stoddard, the original design consists of a boiler that forces steam through a set of whistle pipes. A keyboard or a pinned cylinder are used to direct the steam into the proper pipes, and like we said before, Baker's version of this instrument used compressed air instead of steam, which made it easily transportable. Great for vaudeville and circus acts, right? So now you know. You're welcome. Word of the day. Obviously, with his lack of musical education, Norman didn't work on this project alone. He had the help of his father-in-law. According to Thomas Hopper's Norman Baker and American Broadcasting, it sounds like this venture was indeed successful, as apparently during the first year of operation, the business grossed $60,000. He ran ads in Billboard magazine starting in 1914 for many years and claimed that his Air Calliophone grossed 200000 in a single year. The gross sales totaled over $1.5 million dollars between 1916 and 1920. The Calliophone business blew up. Somewhere between 8 to 10 employees worked day and night making instruments as fast as they could. In July of 1920, a fire destroyed his entire factory, and at the time, his insurance company was partially bankrupt and could only pay back the deposits made for future orders. Luckily, it only took a few months for the three-story building on Chestnut Street in Muscatine to recover and return to running two shifts, a day shift and a night shift, nonstop for months at a time, including Sundays. Business was booming. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. So at this point, he's married, living with his dad, their organists and pianists, father-in-law, father-in-law, and now they're making the calliophones themselves, correct? And they have a factory yes. where they're just putting them out left and right. Make them bang. All right. So I do feel like we need to backtrack a little bit to discuss the sudden but amicable divorce of Norman Baker and his wife and star performer, Teresa. I was unable to find any specific reason for the split or much detail about Teresa specifically. I can tell you that Norman never did remarry. Anyway, I just felt like that was important to throw in there. We can move on now forward from 1920 
to the good stuff or the bad stuff, however you want to look at it. So in 1924, Baker asked the town of Muscatine to allow him a radio station, boasting that he would make the town famous across the Midwest. Apparently, they bought what he was selling because the station, with the call sign KTNT, was operational was operational by November of 1925. KTNT or Know the Naked Truth broadcast with 500 watts on 256.3 meters. Of course, they played the calliophone for their sign on. Once on the air, Baker immediately began ranting boisterously against what he alleged was a cartel of broadcasters. And that's a pretty good way to make friends. One time I had a mechanic who... I had never had work on my car before, and he was referred to me by a relative of his. And I swear, from the time I met him, he did nothing but just run down and talk crap about every other mechanic in the entire area, and it was an immediate turnoff. You ever have that happen? Surprisingly, there's a lot of people like that out there. This guy was exceptional, though. I'm telling you. It was every time I saw him. He just found another two or three to tell stories or talk about. The only way to make yourself look good is to make everyone else look bad. That's not how we roll. No. So there's a lesson for our listeners. Don't be that. Don't be one of those. I want you right up here with me. Yeah. Right here at the top. We're at the top? Are We're we at the, the top. We're <laughs> damn good. I'm glad you feel this is the top. Yes. That's a positive outlook. <laughs> I'm always at the top. <laughs> Well, it must have made him some friends because by 1925, Baker was president of American Broadcasters Association, a short-lived group which lobbied against radio monopolies. And by short-lived, we mean this group only lasted through 1927, so just a couple of years. In 1928, Baker's show began broadcasting at 10,000 watts, allowing his show to reach over 1 million homes. He gained a lot of notoriety through radio and became so popular that thousands of people would come to the station just to hear his broadcast. Not to mention that he had become quite wealthy from his multiple successful businesses by this time in his life. Quite a feat if you ask me, especially given the Depression. After broadcasting on behalf of Herbert Hoover's 1928 presidential campaign, Hoover pressed a golden key from the White House to repay Baker for his support and ceremoniously initiated publication of Baker's newspaper, the Midwest Free Press. But still, it wasn't enough. Baker slipped a little off the deep end and started alienating himself from his listeners with character assassinations towards those that he considered to be his enemies. He would go so far as to accuse them of things like adultery and drunkenness on the air. Unfortunately for him, these tirades did more to damage his own reputation than those that he tried to smear. And on top of that, he also began broadcasting anti-Jewish, pro-Hitler comments mostly aimed at the medical establishment. Eventually, the local listeners began to distrust and turn against him. I don't understand why. Yeah, I can't imagine. He sounds so pleasant. In 1929, Baker heard through the grapevine about a Dr. Charles Ozius who had allegedly discovered a cure for cancer. Upon hearing of this, Norman offered to pay for five volunteers with cancer to be sent to Dr. Ozius for this treatment study, the findings of which were to be published in the December issue of Baker's tabloid magazine, TNT, or The Naked Truth. Indeed, he delivered. At the end of 1929, a sensational story touting an unconventional cancer treatment was indeed published. In November of 1929, however, the first of the five volunteer patients to receive the treatments did die. In spite of this, his December issue of TNT was still headlined with the title Cancer Cured, or something along those lines. Then in December, the second of the five volunteers succumbed to this treatment. The third died in January of 1930, and the fourth volunteer died that February. Still, the paper reprinted the December article, which heroically praised the cure by advertising the miraculous recovery of all five volunteer patients. In May, the last of the five miraculously recovered volunteers died. Inspired by the work of Dr. Ozius, Baker opened his own cancer hospital in Muscatine, Iowa, which he staffed with chiropractors, naturopaths, and diploma mill MDs. Bust out the lavender oil, Karen. We're going to cure the world right there at the Baker Institute for the Treatment of Cancer Sufferers. But obviously, he already knew this didn't work, right? He was convinced that using aluminum-based products, utensils, and other products caused cancer, and operations, radium, or x-ray could not cure it. He disrespected surgeons, calling them cutters. Well, that's pretty fair. Like, nurses are just doctor assistants, and paramedics and EMTs are just ambulance drivers. I don't see the issue. Ha ha ha. That was a joke. Don't yell at us. 
Anyway, he got his grubby rich hands on the Dr. Ozius cure in January of 1930. The formula was touted as a miracle injection that cured cancer. He shoved this snake oil down the throats of the public and brought desperate patients flocking to him. Actually, he left the snake in the essential oils at home. His cure was actually made from a much more common substance like corn silk, watermelon seeds, clover, tea, alcohol, water, and oh, carbolic acid, which if you aren't aware is pretty gosh darn poisonous if you touch or swallow it, but no big deal. Also, he charged an arm and a leg for these injections. You don't need your arm or your leg because you're going to die. Yep. He used his radio show to promote the hospital, and despite already claiming to have a cure for cancer, he employed Harry Hoxie, a charlatan with his own alleged cure for cancer. And in the year 1930 alone, the Baker Institute had raked in earnings of over $440,000, all at the expense of cancer patients desperate for the cure. At this point, though, the American Medical Association had the Institute and Baker in their sight and aggressively sought to expose him for the fraud that he was. Good looking out, bruh. In the April edition of the Journal of the Medical Association, the editor published an article which stated the following, The viciousness of Mr. Baker's broadcasting lies not in what he says about the American Medical Association, but in the fact that he induces sufferers from cancer who might have some chance for their lives if seen early and properly treated to resort to his nostrum. Baker didn't like this, and he fired back with his own outlandish claim, alleging that the AMA offered him $1 million for his cancer cure, with the intention of eliminating it as a treatment option in order to continue to use surgical means for the removal of cancerous tumors. On top of that accusation, Baker took legal action against the AMA on the grounds of libel and defamation. He also claimed that three assassins had come to the KTNT station to silence him at the behest of the AMA. He elaborately detailed that during the gun battle, Hoxie supposedly shot one of the assassins before the three ninja killers made their getaway. Wow. Just wow. The American Medical Association really crossed the line there. Assassins. Really? Come on. Come on. Come on. (laughs) You piece of shit. (laughs) The Des Moines Register published a reprint of the story that the AMA had published, as well as diving into their own investigation of Baker and his claims. The independent investigation revealed that a large number of the patients of the Baker Institute had in fact not miraculously recovered after their treatment, that Baker's cure for cancer was completely fake, and in fact, the patients were dying. Weird. Meanwhile, the police investigated Baker's assassination attempt. The case was dropped due to a lack of evidence. Weird again. Weird. In May 1930, the state of Iowa filed for an injunction against Baker, Hoxie, and three others for practicing medicine without a license. That month, Baker held an outdoor public demonstration of his cure to quell any doubts about its validity. The Woodstock-type event drew an estimated crowd of nearly 50,000 people. The demonstration included people claiming to be former patients of the Baker Institute, singing about how Baker's treatment had cured them. Included in his antics of the day, Baker consumed a large quantity of the formula, trying to prove that it was harmless. After that, a man named Mandis Johnson underwent a live surgery to remove a brain tumor. So they just did a surgery out there on the street? Okay. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. While Johnson was still conscious, the formula was applied, and then Baker announced that his cancer is cured. Well, you heard it here, folks. That's enough proof for me. The AMA, however, was not convinced. They asserted that surgery performed on Mandis Johnson was a hoax claiming that Johnson had a condition which caused inflammation of the outer part of his skull. So they said that they couldn't have cured his cancer because he didn't have it. It was just another condition. So Baker continued attacking the AMA on his radio show, and the AMA petitioned the Federal Radio Commission to take him off the air. During the spring of 1931, Baker's crusade against preventative medicine was partially to blame for inciting a rebellion in eastern Iowa, which is apparently known as the Cow War. I'm learning so much much about Iowa that I did not know. I thought I really knew a lot, but no. His broadcast encouraged farmers to resist state veterinarians' efforts to enforce mandatory bovine tuberculosis testing, claiming it was a ruse for meat packers to acquire cheap beef. <laughs> when the standoff escalated into outbursts of barnyard violence, Governor Dan Turner called out the state militia to squash the rebellion. See, all this does sound like Iowa. Rebellion and barnyard violence. It all sounds very Star Wars. It's very Iowa Star Wars. 
Where are the rebels come now? Yes. This is why I love I love this state. <laughs> in the end, the AMA gets what AMA wants. In May of 1931, the Federal Radio Commission refused to renew Baker's license. He lost his court case against the AMA and was issued an arrest warrant for practicing medicine without a license. What else was he to do? He left behind his Midwest life of corn-fed luxury and headed south. To Mexico, to be exact. But... His relocation didn't stop him from continuing his war against his sworn enemies. After losing his court case against the AMA, he saw no other option but to find vindication through Iowa politics. He joined the race for governor in 1932 as a write-in candidate on the farm labor ticket, but... He campaigned from Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, where he constructed yet another 100,000-watt radio station, XENT, which, it sounds like, broadcasts a mostly eclectic mix of lowbrow hillbilly-style musical entertainment. One of his usual tirades was typically included, as well as the touting of cancer cures. Baker's tirade targets were numerous, and his rants included anti-Semitic and anti-Catholic sentiments. It was also rumored that he would broadcast live while having sex with his mistresses. Baker's campaign for governor was never considered less than entertaining. Such was his nature, as he sent campaign trucks with colorful banners and loudspeakers blaring speeches and carnival music through Iowa counties. On election day, however, he drew a mere 5,000 votes. So this kind of reminds me of the Tiger King's campaigns. When he ran for public office. Yep. And actually, I hadn't added this in, but like Joe Exotic was known for his fancy dress. (laughs) Yes, fancy dress. (laughs) Typically, um, Baker was found wearing purple or lavender shirts and ties to accent his fancy white suits. He also drove an orchid colored car. And it sounds like he was a handsome guy who was described to have hypnotic eyes, according to Wikipedia anyway. So I guess in the words of Joe Exotic... You ain't that straight. (laughs) (laughs) And actually, he stole that line from Ron White. Anyway, moving on. Did he? Yes. Is Ron White the tater salad guy? Okay. You ain't that straight. (laughs) I never, like, thought he was that funny. Ron White? Yeah. No, I didn't either. He's the guy that, like, drinks with the glass, right? Mm -hmm. And he's a tater salad. Okay. Yeah, tater salad. He's okay. After a few years in exile, Baker returned to Muscatine and served one day for his warrant for practicing medicine without a license. Baker then took the jump to Iowa's U.S. senatorial races as a Republican candidate in 1936, but he had lost enough popularity to finish only fifth in the primary. After his Muscatine Hospital was discredited by RKO, Baker just went ahead and shut it down. Unfortunately, this was not the end of Norman Baker or his cancer cures. Norman Baker simply relocated to Eureka Springs, Arkansas in the year 1937 moving his cancer hospital operation with him. He purchased the 1886 Victorian Hotel perched on 27 acres at the north end of West Mountain, a location chosen for its majestic location overlooking the valley. The 78-room resort hotel is now known as one of America's most distinctive and historic destinations. The hotel was built by the Eureka Springs Improvement Company and the Frisco Railroad. It was designed by Isaac L. Taylor, who was a well-known Missouri architect, that had designed many famous buildings in St. Louis. Former governor of Arkansas from 1868 to 1870, Powell Clayton. Bill Clinton? No. I did not have. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> did he also not inhale? Was so, he the same guy? Bill Clinton? No. Or was that Obama? Obama didn't inhale. Bill Clinton did not have sexual relations with that woman. That's right. So anyway, Powell Clayton formed the Eureka Springs Improvement Company in hopes of taking advantage of this prosperous period. The Frisco Railroad, as well as a slew of other investors, joined in on the plan, knowing that the resort could only improve their business. Ha <laughs> ha boy, they were not correct. Well, this was before Baker bought it. Oh, okay. Then okay, it probably was. Stonemasons were brought in from Ireland in 1884. That must have been a thing, because remember Trans-Allegheny did that same thing. To make them all fancy and pretty and gothic looking. So they brought in the stonemasons from Ireland in 1884 to begin the construction. Because the magnesium limestone used to build the hotel was so dense, they had to build special wagons in order to move the massive pieces of stone from the quarry site to the White River. In an interview he did before going back to Ireland, the spokesman of the group of specialist builders recalled, quote, Throughout the many years of his stone working, he had never encountered a stone with such density and quality as the White River limestone. 
According to the Crescent Hotel History website, he made the prediction that it would become a popular building stone in the future. He also said that because of its unique characteristics, as they had built 18-inch thick walls, which were fitted without the use of mortar, this building would withstand the destructive forces of time and retain its original beauty for many years to come. The building also features a number of towers, overhanging balconies, as well as a massive stone fireplace in the lobby. 18-inch thick walls. Yep. No mortar. That's crazy. Because it's so heavy, it just sits, right? The construction of this grand structure continued for two years. They brought more and more workmen, adding electrical lights, modern plumbing, steam heating, an elevator, extensive landscaping, large airy rooms with exquisite furnishings, a dining room that once seated more than 500 people, a swimming pool, tennis courts, and croquet, a beautiful landscape of flower gardens, winding boardwalks and gazebos, luxurious decorations and amenities to the extravagant hotel. All said and done, the total monetary investment to build this hotel was around 294000 which, as I'm sure you're aware, was an extremely extravagant amount of money for that time. The reason for both the existence of Eureka Springs itself as well as the hotel is the water. More than 60 springs bubbled up healing water in and around Eureka's downtown area. This was an important time in Eureka Springs history as these healing waters of the Ozarks had become well known all across America. People from all over were swarming to the area with hopes of curing their ailments and easing their pain. In the year 1854, pioneer doctor Alva Jackson found himself at the Basin Spring. Miraculously, the waters healed his young son's injured eye, and Jackson began using the healing water in his medical practice, treating soldiers from both sides during the Civil War. In March of 1862, the Battle of Pea Ridge had him well occupied with patients being treated in the healing waters of the springs. After the war, He stayed in the area and invited Judge L.B. Saunders to join him at the springs as he suffered from a leg injury that may be healed by the waters. It took less than two months for his leg to heal. Judge Saunders, who of course was quite influential, shared his miracle to anyone that would hear it. They named the settlement Eureka Springs in the summer of 1879. Eureka! We've been waiting that whole paragraph. The whole time. To do that. News of the healing springs spread like wildfire. Spread like wildfire. (laughs) Claiming that they had the power to cure everything from hay fever to cancer, baldness, and feminine problems were also among the long list of illnesses or ailments that could be cured by the waters of the springs. There was a dramatic increase in population and activity in the area, which of course brings with it wealthy capitalists and the creation of the Eureka Springs Improvement Company, or the ESIC. The company's intended market were not only the sick and suffering people seeking cures, but also the wealthy looking for a vacation. The developers planned to take full advantage of these many travelers by building the most luxurious resort in the country, which is what they did. And this, my friends, is what Norman Baker planned to do as well. But before we get to Baker, the ESIC was responsible for the operation of the hotel for about 15 years. Unfortunately, in that span of time, people began to realize more and more that the waters were not as magical as advertised. Little by little, people stopped coming, and the extravagant concept that was the Crescent Hotel fell to ruin. In 1902, the hotel was leased to the Frisco Railroad. This arrangement lasted for five years, and due to slow business, the Crescent College was born, providing education to the daughters of many prominent families at the time. At a time when educated women were relatively uncommon, this lasted until 1934. So this brings us back to Norman Baker, still claiming to have the cure for cancer. He called the newly purchased Crescent a quote castle in the air and broadcast over the radio that he could cure cancer without carving patients up you know, like the butcher surgeons do. Obviously, we know by now that Baker actually had no cure for cancer, but still, patients flocked to a second cancer center, Baker Hospital, in Eureka Springs. After taking over the operation of the facility, his flamboyance became apparent while he remodeled much of the hotel. Dousing it in lavender, he also built an escape route from his first floor office suite, which featured a hidden staircase which is actually pretty cool, to be honest. His office was also home to a sweet six-sided desk, which accommodated the work for his six different businesses. I mean, at least he was practical. And I've had purple walls in my bedroom before, so I'm not going to judge him for the purple. I remember that. You know, let your purple flag fly. I kind of agree with them a little bit, like doing the secret escape chamber. 
So I read a meme one time that I wholeheartedly agree with that if you're a millionaire and you don't have a concrete on concrete, like hidden staircase in your basement, you're doing it wrong. You are doing it wrong. You should. You should have some Indiana Jones shit going on in your house all the time. Bookcases with hidden doors behind them. All the wrong people have the money. And then you got to have the hidden door cases, fake rooms, like full of poisonous snakes. Wrong one. You know. Pull the lever, cronk. Yep. <laughs> and then you can pull a lever and a bridge goes down over the poisonous snake, but it wobbles real bad. And a moat. Well, yeah. With alligators. Yep. No, I'm really scared of alligators. And then a fire moat. Oh, where it's like... <laughs> <laughs> or you, yeah, you dig the deep hole and then fill yeah. it with flammable liquid. And then when you need to, you shoot the flaming arrow and ignite the whole thing. And mm-hmm. then the white walkers can't get you. Yep. Yeah. It would be like a total cross between Indiana Jones and Robin Hood. Like better than Nottingham. Baker told the employees of the new and improved Baker Cancer Center that he would make, quote, millions of dollars off the suckers of the state, end quote. And in the beginning, the community of Eureka Springs strongly supported Baker and its cancer hospital as it benefited the town well. The town was in financial ruin. Now, lacking the tourists and the business which had previously flourished, many of the buildings now stood empty. I wasn't able to find the number of employees that Baker actually had, but I imagine any business that brought jobs and cash flow to the area, especially during the 1937 recession, was looked upon with high hopes. Even though the brochure for the cancer center expressed sentiments like, quote, We are just like one big family living in a mansion like plain folk, Uh end quote. Fake Dr. Baker did not make good on such promises, unless there are other families that keep a secret morgue in the basement. I mean, I'm sure it happened. Mm, I think probably more than we like to know. The hospital staff would transport the deceased patients in the middle of the night from their rooms to the morgue to keep the other patients from seeing them. Which is, as you know, just being courteous, right? Somehow he managed to keep this charade going for two years. Not only that, but he made a ton of money doing it. The hospital raked in an estimated half a million in one year alone. During the Great Depression. Charlatan or not, homie knew how to make that money. Piece of shit. (laughs) Total piece of shit. (laughs) Um, The money-making cancer cure scheme wasn't limited strictly to the walls of the hospital, though. Normie's Miracle Elixir, it wasn't really called that, I just call it that, (laughs) was sold and shipped around the country. It's been estimated that he conned as much as $4 million through the exploitation of hopeful, desperate patients seeking treatment. Although, two years seems like a short-lived business, it wasn't short-lived enough for this operation. He managed to catch the attention of the federal authorities. Seven letters that had been sent via U.S. mail advertising his Baker Hospital proved to be sufficient evidence for them to charge Baker with using the mail for fraudulent practices. He was found guilty of this charge in January of 1940 and subsequently appealed the decision. The appeal was, however, denied as the court affirmed that Baker's claim regarding his miracle cure was pure hoax. Norman continued his outlandish and radical behavior, spewing accusations of conspiracy against him, claiming that the jurors in his case had been bribed with whiskey and women to find him guilty. I mean, that'd do it for me, right? Right? Whiskey and no. He served three to five years in Leavenworth, unsure exactly of how long, because it varied from source to source. This sentence hardly seems appropriate, considering the damage that he had done, the lives he destroyed and even ended. Depriving these poor people, who were suffering already, of the opportunity to obtain legitimate and potentially life-saving treatment from genuine medical professionals. It makes me sick to think about. The only thing of all his crimes that they managed to charge him with was mail fraud. And if that's not bad enough, after his release, I can't believe I'm actually about to say this. The nerve of this guy. He actually tried to reopen the Baker Institute in Muscatine, Iowa in 1946, but it was unsuccessful. Norman then moved to Florida, where he remained the rest of his days living on a large yacht. Seems so unfair, right? He died on September 10th of 1958 of cirrhosis. He's buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Muscatine, Iowa, beside his sister. So, yes, this story was mostly about Norman Baker, but it definitely doesn't end with his death. Long after the conclusion of his two-year stint in Eureka, Arkansas, the Crescent Hotel still stands, a permanent monument to the horrific practices of Dr. Dr. Norman Baker, and the stories of the legacy he left behind are haunting. Literally. So in 1946, the hotel fell under the ownership of four individuals, Herbert Byfield, John R. Constantine, 
Dwight O. Nichols, and Herbert E. Shutter. Under this new management, the hotel underwent a new round of renovations, possibly getting rid of some of the purple, hopefully not the escape route and the secret staircase. The important part is the hotel had been restored to her former glory. The Frisco Railroad offered vacation packages that attracted and brought a new population of tourists to Eureka. According to the website for Historic Hotels for America, there are a multitude of stories alleging the possibility that some of those who had tragically fallen victim to the schemes of quote-unquote Dr. Baker or by other means lost their lives remain in the hotel. One of these rumors is that after the frame of the hotel had been constructed in the 1880s, one of the Irish stonemasons fell from the bare-bones structure, plummeting to his death, landing in what today exists as room 218. According to guests and staff, this room is reportedly one of the most common areas for seeing paranormal activity. In fact, Many television film crews have been spending decades setting up attempts to catch a glimpse of these reported ghost sightings. That sounds like a great mini vacation. Actually, Arkansas is not that far. It's only like a day. It's like seven hours or eight, isn't it, from Iowa? Let's go stay there. Room 208, 218. Throughout the history of the Victorian Hotel, employees have referred to this entity as Michael, a classified poltergeist due to the nature of the unexplained activity. Guests have witnessed hands coming out of the bathroom mirror, cries of a falling man in the ceiling, the door opening and then slamming shut, unable to be opened again. The intrigue of this activity had drawn guests to specifically request the historic accommodations of room 218 for the chance of experiencing something. 218 had been given the title the ghost mom because of the large number of guests who had experienced supernatural phenomena there. Why the ghost mom? That's just what they called. Visitors have reported hearing strange sounds in room 218 at night. One time, a bellboy had just opened the door when suddenly it slammed right in his face. One guest said he could not sleep in the room because something was shaking him awake. The most commonly seen ghost in the Crescent Hotel is a distinguished looking man wearing a beard and formal clothing. He has been seen in room 218, but he usually appears in the lobby and in the bar area. In the hotel's crystal dining room, many employees have encountered playful spirits in Victorian dress. One holiday season, while the dining room was closed, the Christmas tree and packages underneath moved from one end of the room to the other. The next morning, employees found the tree and packages moved with chairs circling and facing the newly placed holiday symbol. Another time, employees returned in the morning to find the dining room in perfect order, except for the menus scattered throughout the room. And yet another time, a waitress looked into the huge mirror between the doors from the dining room to the kitchen and saw a man and a woman in Victorian dress facing each other as in a wedding. The groom turned and made eye contact with the waitress, and then the couple faded away. The waitress quit her job shortly after this incident. I think that would be every reason for me to keep that job. Right? Yes. I'd be like, this is the best place to work ever. And I'm wearing a GoPro to work. I want more. More of this. Another commonly reported paranormal activity is a man in Victorian clothing sitting at a table near the window saying, quote, I saw the most beautiful woman here last night and I'm waiting for her to return, end quote. Many have recounted seeing apparitions in Victorian ball attire dancing around the room during the wee hours of the morning while the room was closed and dark. Animalian.com shares some more tragic death and haunting stories, including this creepy little nugget from the period in which the hotel was a school for girls in which a student fell in love with a local boy who happened to belong to one of the lower class families in the area. Being from what they considered to be a higher class family, her father would not allow her to continue seeing him. The girl was apparently very unhappy with her father's rules against dating this boy because she reportedly threw herself from the highest balcony of the building. The incident was kept quiet, and despite the high cost, enrollments continued. This article also specified that there is a significant amount of reported ghostly activity in room 414. One 414 story describes, quote, A family was watching television when a shapeless thing walked through the outside door, crossed the room, and entered the bathroom. Frantically, they called down to the desk complaining that their room was haunted. They were promptly given a room in another local hotel. Why would you leave? I know if I saw that I'd be so I mean I'd be scared, but I'd be like, yes, this is this is what I've needed. Validation. Mm-hmm. Also in this article, there's a story from the early 1990s in which, quote, an auditor entered the bar after closing hours to get a drink of water. 
He clearly saw a bearded man sitting on a bar stool. The auditor tried to talk to him, but the strange man did not answer back. The auditor left the bar to get his partner. When he returned, the figure was gone. One of the auditors went to the lobby to look for the man. As he stood at the foot of the ornate staircase, the auditor saw the man from the bar staring down at him from the second floor landing. The auditor began walking up the stairs but felt something pushing him back as he approached the second floor. He immediately reported the incident to the manager. A website called YourGhostStories.com also had some rather good stories to share about the Grand Lady of the Ozarks. Now, do you remember the creepy basement morgue part of the story earlier? Well, Dr. Baker's old autopsy table and walk-in freezer are apparently still down there. There's definitely some scare factor in that. Also, in the third floor laundry area, a maintenance man working in the hotel reported all of the washers and dryers to inexplicably turn on by themselves in the middle of the night. Also on the third floor, what appears to be the spirit of a nurse dressed all in white has been spotted on multiple occasions, pushing a gurney in the hall, but they only report seeing her after 11 p.m. Do you know why? Because they used to move the deceased patients out of the cancer hospital in the dead of night to keep them out of sight of the other patients, remember? The nurse supposedly vanishes when she searches when she reaches the end of the hallway. There are some people who state that they have never actually seen the nurse apparition, but they have reported hearing the sounds of squeaks and rattles, like a gurney rolling down the hallway. The ghost of Norman Baker has also been seen in the basement and the first floor stairway, wearing his signature purple shirt and white linen suit looking somewhat confused. The spirit has been claimed to look identical to the old photographs of the infamous doctor. Theodora is the name of an infamous spirit that has been seen often by housekeepers in room 419. She courteously introduces herself as a cancer patient and then she disappears. The author of the submission to yourghoststories.com, just another Tory, described her own experience while visiting the hotel. Quote, on our way up the stairs between the third and fourth floor, all three of us got the feeling of vertigo and my husband started feeling sick. He said it was like an inner ear infection or something. He just felt so incredibly dizzy. She goes on to say, I passed another guest on the stairs who was having the same problem. He laughed as he passed me and said, You know, a five-year-old died a while back on this very staircase. He was on the fourth floor and had an inner ear infection. He lost his balance and fell all the way down to the basement and died instantly. Since then, these stairs have been impossible to climb without hanging on. She thought, Inner ear infection? That's what my husband mentioned, and we had no idea about that. So that's a pretty crazy story, don't you think? She also recounts that on another visit to the hotel, she kept hearing the name Michael whispered in her ear. So do you remember that two or three week period that I was so freaked out all the time about ghosts because I kept hearing whispering in my ear everywhere that I went? Everywhere? I wouldn't tell a lot of people about it. Yeah. Not that I don't believe in ghosts and haunting, but my particular whispering experience was the result of side effects of a medication that caused auditory hallucinations. Medication called, I don't remember what it was called. Topamax. Topamax. Apparently that's a thing. Apparently. She wasn't schizophrenic after all. That was a good time. <laughs> Still not 100% convinced. But it is pretty convenient that the voices stop when I stop taking the medication. Yeah. The CrescentHotel.com has a blog including entries such as Haunting Ghost Experience Reveal, where stories have been shared and published about the sightings of the wayward spirits of the hotel. On this blog, a quote from the director of the hotel's ghost tour, Keith Scales, states this, quote, From smelling mysterious pipe tobacco to seeing an orb entering a boy's skull, our ghost tour guides are exposed nightly to the hotel's guests who check out but never leave. He goes on to say, With that said, each has not only a unique nom de guide, but a special supernatural experience of their own to tell. It is their reason for being a tour guide in this world-famous haunted hotel. The guide, lovingly referred to as Aunt Reba, described experiencing the smell of cherry pipe tobacco as she reached the second floor when she visited the tourist attraction as a guest. Two years later, while training to be a tour guide, she learned that the hotel's in-house doctor in the late 19th century, Dr. John Fremont Ellis, is known for being a very heavy pipe smoker of cherry tobacco. His office was what is now room 212. According to Aunt Reba, she was leading a group tour of 24 people. We all simultaneously experienced that olfactory sensation for well over a minute. And let it be understood that our entire hotel is a no-smoking property, and it has been for years. 
Like her specific experience is actually kind of common in investigating like haunted locations. Um, we were at one location where me and some other people were investigating a supposed haunting. And we were overwhelmed by the smell of roses out of nowhere. No no roses were around, and then the smell was suddenly gone. It was rumored in that location to be common to smell roses on occasion in a specific lady's room because she apparently used a rose water perfume. So that was kind of cool. I don't know if this is really applicable. I live in my grandmother and grandfather's old house, and we've lived here since, what, 2016? And our grandfather passed away in 2013. And once in a while, I'll still be walking around my house, and it really doesn't smell like them anymore since we've been living here. But once in a while, I'll be walking around my house, and all of a sudden, I'll get a whiff, and it smells like my Grandpa Gary. But it's just here and there. And sometimes you can you randomly smell his cigars. Yeah, yep, his cigars. Like, he always smoked those vanilla swisher sweets and we not only find the butts to them still once in a while out in the yard but we can you can smell them it's weird and you wouldn't think it would linger for that long so it makes you kind of wonder what that is so the blog continues sharing the experience of another guide known as duchess deborah who not only offers fabulous tours of the hotel but performs in a two-person paranormal play titled not really a door at the hotel on Friday and Saturday night. One night, she was on stage with her co-star during a performance, and at that time, they shout, Ghost! in unison. Four prop books went flying off of the shelf toward the audience, quote, as if someone or something had tossed them like a frisbee, end quote. Luckily, no one was hit by the flying prop, but the unexplainable incident definitely got everyone's attention. During a tour led by Sandra, one of the visitors voiced that she clearly saw and emphatically heard a man with a buzz cut hairstyle say the words, what about my treatment? Two other people on that same tour said that they saw in their peripheral vision a blurred figure of a man go by in that same vicinity at that same time. During another tour on a separate occasion, guide Catherine was at the bottom of an open staircase with her group before entering what is described as the zigzagging trail to the morgue. They were all standing still when she suddenly felt a chill and developed goosebumps. She felt suddenly that it was hard to breathe. The two ladies sitting beside her turned pale and asked, Did anyone feel that? It's the little girl. She's here. I can feel her. So, the story with the little girl is that allegedly... She fell to her death from the fourth floor railing sometime during the early years of the hotel, and the exact spot where the tour group was standing is where she landed. What adds a little more creep factor to this story is that one of the other people on the tour, a man, shouted, Oh my, look at this photo! And he passed his camera around to everyone to show them the photo that he snapped right before the chilling experience, and everyone could see plain as day, a foggy mist in the shape of a little girl standing right next to the three women. According to the blog, though, the photographer did not submit his image to the hotel's paranormal website, americasmosthauntedhotel.com. So, it's not available for viewing, which kind of blows. Dang it, guy. If any of you decide to go take a tour and get a picture or a video of something cool, for goodness sakes, Submit it to the website. And on a, tag us on Facebook. Uh, yeah, tag us. That'd be awesome. On a tour with Major Tom. <laughs> Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Sorry, don't reverb that. A man and his wife had differing attitudes about the paranormal. She believed he did not and made that pretty clear by giving off negative body language throughout the visit. At the conclusion of the tour, they turned off the lights in the morgue standing in the darkness next to the autopsy table and the walk-in cadavers cooler. The guests are encouraged to take digital photos to see if they can catch an orb, which, in case you aren't familiar with the term, is what is considered to be the energy essence of a ghost, which appears as a ball of light or mist in a photo. Now, we have our own theory on orbs, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, tour guide Major Tom's back was turned away from the group when a scream of terror permeated the silence and the skeptical husband went running out of the morgue. They flipped the lights back on and brought him back into the room. He appeared quite pale and to quote the blog, he meekly confessed that he had seen an orb with his naked eye as it flew between his face and the camera. Long story short, he saw an orb 
Now he's a believer. Saw an orb. Now he's a believer. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely reverb. <laughs> That's awesome. During these tours, each guide carries an EMF meter or an electromagnetic field meter, which is used to detect electromagnetic emissions that a nearby spirit may radiate. During one of the tours, a guest said that she sensed that a certain spot on the morgue's floor was full of energy. The guide, named Willow, placed her handy-dandy meter down on that spot on the floor of the morgue. Every person on that tour witnessed as the meter began beeping and flashing like crazy. Willow then asked, If there is indeed a spirit in this room, please make the meter slow down. And the meter's lights and noises slowed down abruptly. After moments of heartbeat-like pulses, the spirit was asked to again increase the activity of the meter, and it did, for a few more moments before falling dormant. So obviously, we want to save one of the best stories for last. This is another morgue story which occurred under the watchful eye of a tour guide, John Marshall John Law. For the record, I am all about these tour guide personas. Anyway, at the tour's conclusion, after they shut off the morgue lights and then turn them back on, the guests are given the opportunity to head on into the infamous walk-in cadaver cooler to have the door shut behind them, alone, in total darkness. So, during this tour, a mother and her 12-year-old son volunteered. Video camera in hand, they stepped into the space that had housed hundreds of dead bodies and innumerable severed body parts during the baker's stint in the cancer center. So... I'm not sure where the body parts come from and who was cutting them off since he was so against surgeons, but apparently it was a thing. Well, he was only against surgeons because he wanted to sell his cure. Yeah. He didn't really give a crap if they were cutting into people, you know. The door was closed behind them. They opened the door after only about 30 seconds and the boy stumbled out. His mother said, please move. My son is getting sick. It indeed sounds like he looked quite ill. They sat the kid in a chair near the entrance of the morgue, which they keep there for exactly this purpose. It was apparently not uncommon for a guest to feel faint or sick while spending time in a room, which was the last stop for so many at the hands of a charlatan who killed rather than curing his unsuspecting and hopeful cancer patients. Once the kid was settled and the mom knew he was okay, she explained to the group, you have to see this, and she played the video she had captured in the dark cooler. On the video, the blog describes an occasional glint of colored light coming from above her son's head that illuminated his face just enough for you to tell that it was him. One of the lights did not fade like the others but began swinging back and forth. As this light did eventually fade, a larger, brighter white light, as bright as a camera flash, appeared and continued to glow just above her son's head. It slowly descended and disappeared as if it were entering his head, only to suddenly reappear escaping from his skull a split second before the door opened for the boy to make his escape. Ew. There are plenty of other stories of seemingly paranormal encounters at this hotel. I encourage you wholeheartedly to head over there and experience one for yourself on video. Take pictures. Share those pictures. I know it's on my list and Sam's list of things to do now. That is all we have for you this week. So thank you so much again for listening to Bigfoot for Breakfast. And we hope that you were as intrigued and disgusted by the events discussed as we were. Now that we've gotten our feet wet in the art of advertising for haunted tourist attractions, if y'all would give us a shout out if you've ever visited the Haunted Crescent Hotel, that would be so awesome. Or if they want to offer us a complimentary vacation package, that would be great too. We would not complain and we would definitely go. They host weddings. Look up the website. It's absolutely gorgeous. All joking aside, even though we aren't totally joking about the vacation package. If you want to contact us for any reason, just shoot us an email, bigfootforbreakfast at outlook.com. You can send us a Facebook message or you can post on our wall. We love memes. Let's get interactive, guys. Send us some memes. Send us all the memes. We love memes. Love the memes. And compliments. We do love compliments. Also, you can leave us a voicemail and let us know what you think of the show. Show us some love or bombard us with public ridicule, you know, whatever. We will play it on the next episode. The number is 641-812-2635. Thank you so much for listening and we will see you next week. Call me maybe. You just got Jepson. <laughs> Come at me, bro.